Hello, Kin 163 students. Um, so this is going to be the chapter three from the fitness book, Fit and Well, uh, Fahi, Insel, and Roth. And the name of the chapter is Cardio Respiratory Endurance. As you can remember, this is the first component of health related fitness that we discussed in the second chapter. So from now on, we're going to dive into every single uh, component of fitness individually uh, with a, a, a different chapter. So this is chapter three from the fitness book. Um, this chapter is going to take a little while, as, as you can see from the outline. We're, we will cover some anatomy, um, so we will discuss what cardio means, cardiorespiratory means, cardiovascular means, and, uh, and cardiorespiratory endurances. Then we will look at all the systems, pulmonary and cardiovascular systems, that are incorporated into cardiorespiratory systems. And um, the third one is blood pressure. And then we will cover some relevant t terminology to understand the uh, cardiorespiratory endurance concept better. And then we will discuss how we measure endurance and then how we develop endurance or fitness with the FIT principle that we discussed again in the second chapter. Then we will talk about the safety issues and injury prevention. And then these last two uh, will cover the body's responses to acute exercise which means the immediate responses that your body will give once you start exercising. And then the, the final one is the training effects or adaptations that are chronic or long-term. So what is cardio uh, for starters? Cardio is cardiovascular system and most people use cardiovascular, I mean cardio, in, in, instead of cardiovascular. So when you see cardio in terms of an exercise or an equipment, you will understand that, that that's what they mean, cardiovascular. And your cardiovascular system, I'm not talking about cardiorespiratory yet, but your uh, cardiovascular system includes your heart and your blood vessels. And then the respiratory system uh, is your pulmonary system. In other words, is your lungs. When we talk about cardiorespiratory system, that is the system responsible for circulating the blood through the body so that nutrients such as oxygen, carbohydrates, protein, fat, and etc. can be delivered to where they are needed and the waste products such as carbon dioxide, urea, and etc. gotten rid of the body. So if you see this picture here, this is a, a typical picture where they represent the cardiorespiratory system including your heart in the middle, lungs on the sides, and all the blood vessels that um, provide the transportation of blood and hence the nutrients or waste products uh, between the different uh, destination points. As you can see here, the lower body and the upper body and then all the veins that connects them. So um, circulating the blood through the body is the task of cardiorespiratory system and it will co uh, contain or consist of the heart, blood vessels, and the respiratory system. In other words, your lungs. When you look at the definition of cardiorespiratory endurance, it is the ability to perform prolonged large muscle dynamic exercise at moderate to high intensities. So it depends, the in endurance depends on the ability of your lungs to take in the oxygen and expel carbon dioxide 
and also depends on the capacity of your heart and your blood vessels to deliver the nutrients and oxygen to tissues and remove wastes. That's basically it. So the heart. Your heart is a four-chambered, fist-sized muscle. Yes, it is a muscle located just beneath the sternum or your breastbone. We will see this in the um, uh, in a picture on the next slide. It pumps oxygen-poor blood to the lungs and delivers oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. Okay, so the blood travels through the two separate circulatory systems. So the right is pulmonary. Again, they're color coded. Right side of your heart is responsible from the pulmonary communication or circulation. So the right side is only going to deal with the lungs. It will pump the oxygen poor blood to the lungs. And then the left side is responsible from delivering the clean or oxygen rich blood to the rest of the body. That's why they're in red. The period of the heart's contraction, since it is a muscle, it will contract and it will relax. The period of the contraction is called systole and the period of relaxation is called diastole. During systole, your heart will pump the blood to the lungs and the body and during diastole, blood flows back into your heart. This is important to remember for understanding the blood pressure concept. And the next component in the cardiovascular system is the vessels, blood vessels. I call it highway. As you saw it in the other picture, it is the highway of uh, the um, blood transportation line. So the blood vessels can be thought of the network of highways in the blood transportation process and are classified by size and function. Okay, remember veins will always be displayed in blue in majority of the books or documents and the arteries will be documented or displayed in red. The reason is that veins will carry blood back to the heart okay and arteries you can remember they both start start with a arteries will carry the blood away from your heart except for the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein so um, pulmonary artery carries oxygen deficient blood from the heart to the lungs since it is a, an artery, it carries blood away from the heart, remember. But this, in this case, it carries the oxygen deficient blood from the heart to the lungs to be converted into an oxygen rich blood. And therefore, it is shown as blue, okay, the artery. The pulmonary vein carries oxygen rich blood back to the heart as it is shown in red okay arteries um, excuse me veins have thin walls and arteries have thick elastic walls that enable them to expand and relax with the volume of blood being pumped through them so veins will have thin walls but arteries since veins um, carry the blood back to the heart they cannot deal with a lot of pressure or resistance but arteries have thick uh, elastic walls and then the smallest arteries branch still further into capillaries as you can see in the middle so the veins will meet the artery capillaries excuse me, vein capillaries will meet the artery capillaries. So both of them turn into smaller branches called capillaries. 
These are tiny vessels, only one cell thick, and the capillaries deliver oxygen and nutrient-rich blood to the tissues and pick up oxygen-poor, waste-loaded blood. Th this is called a gas exchange. This happens through diffusion at the capillary level, right here. So when they meet, the vein bringing the pulmonary vein, uh, excuse me, uh, pulmonary artery bringing uh, the um, oxygen deficient blood uh, back to the lungs and pulmonary vein delivering oxygen um, rich blood back to the heart. The gas exchange happens right in the middle. Okay, this uh, process is called diffusion as you can remember from your chemistry in high school. Okay, there is also another concept that you need to understand that even though your body is filled with different arteries delivering the blood to the different destinations, uh, the heart needs its own, own oxygen uh, delivery. And that, that's why, because the blood pumped through the heart doesn't reach the heart's own cells, so this organ has its own network of blood vessels. These are two large vessels, the right and the left coronary arteries. Okay, these are called coronary arteries. They branch off of the aorta, this one. Okay, the aorta is the largest artery supplying blood to the body from the heart. So the aorta branches into two, right and left, coronary arteries supplying heart with the needed oxygen. Okay, so this is what is going on. You don't need to under, I mean, it, memorize or remember any of this. This is for you to appreciate what's going on and to see the bigger picture. The right side is the pulmonary communication or circulation and the left side is dealing with the body. Okay, so the right side, since the destination is short to reach to the lungs on these two sides, as you can see, the walls of the ventricles or chambers are thin, but the left side, since it has to send the blood all the way up to the head and down to the legs and arms, it's got, it, it got thicker because it's working harder, because it's a muscle, as you can remember. So the right side, pulmonary, left side, systemic circulation. Okay, this is the second component in our cardiorespiratory system, and it is the respiratory system. This uh, system supplies the oxygen to the body, carries off the carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of our body's processes, and helps regulate acid produced during metabolism. So there are three tasks that the, uh, the respiratory system is um, responsible from. Again, just to carry, uh, just to repeat it, it supplies oxygen to the body, one, it carries off the carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, uh, and third, helps regulate acid produced during metabolism. So the air passes in and out of the lungs as a result of pressure changes brought about by contraction and relaxation of the diaphragm and rib muscles or intercostal muscles. So the muscles are responsible from contraction and relaxation so that they create a pressure change to get the air pa mm, passing in or passing out. So as air is inhaled, okay, you inhale either through your mouth or your nose. It passes through the nasal passages, okay, throat, larynx, trachea or the windpipe, okay, or breathing tube or windpipe, and then it gets into the lung tissue, which is called bronch bronchi, which is a branch to the right and to the left 
uh, lungs from the trachea and then uh, into the lungs okay and the, in the lungs those branches become tiny 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 branches called alveoli where the gas exchange happens through the capillaries so the lungs con consist of many branching tubes and these are thin-walled air sacs called alveoli. Carbon dioxide and oxygen are exchanged between alveoli and capillaries in the lungs through diffusion. Carbon dioxide passes from blood cells into the alveoli, okay, and capillaries um, into the alveoli where it's carried up and out of the lungs through ex exhalation. On the other hand, oxygen from the inhaled air passed from the alveoli into the blood cells, and these oxygen-rich blood cells then return back to the heart and are, and are pumped through the body. So oxygen is an important component of the body's energy-producing systems, as we remember from the energy chapter. So oxygen is used in the oxidative system to create ATP, as we remember. And then the ATP is used uh, in our body's functions. More importantly, the movement, okay, function. So the cardiorespiratory system's ability to pick up and deliver oxygen is critical for the functioning of the body because of the ATP. That is why uh, I told you that this component of fitness is the most important one and we don't even have an option of not work, working on improving the cardiorespiratory system because it is directly related to your, heart, uh, to your health. Okay, so as discussed in the previous slides, during systole, heart pumps blood to the lungs and the body during lungs and the body and during diastole blood flows back into the heart because the systole is the contraction of the heart muscle and diastole is the relaxation of the heart muscle where the blood flows back into your heart so during these times th there is going to be a force exerted by blood on the walls of the arteries or the uh, the veins okay the blood vessels mainly the arteries so this is what we call blood pressure and this is what we measure with those either uh, blood cuffs blood pressure cuffs or the new version which is a, a digital version you don't have to pump it it just pumps it automatically as you can see there is a greater number and there is a smaller number so the greater number is your systolic blood pressure where the heart is contracting and the smaller number is the diastolic okay blood pressure and that's when the heart is, muscle is relaxing a healthy resting blood pressure you have to understand this should read less than 120 millimeters mercury for systolic and less than 80 millimeter mercury for diastolic okay less than not even equal to so you're healthy if you want to call your blood pressure healthy this is the latest standard it needs to be <coughs> excuse me systolic needs to be less than 120 and diastolic needs to be less than 80 millimeter mercury <coughs> so some relevant terminology to understand this cardiorespiratory endurance better stroke volume is the amount of blood or volume of blood since it's a liquid and we just use unit of measurement of volume the volume of blood heart pumps out with each beat so it's the amount of blood that your heart is able to pump with every beat and the cardiac output 
the volume of blood that is pumped by the heart per minute. So it is expressed as liters per minute and stroke volume is expressed as liters per beat. And your cardiac output is the product of the heart rate, which is expressed as beats per minute, and stroke volume. So when you do the math, heart rate times stroke volume, you get liters per minute, which is the cardiac output. And um, as we discussed in the previous chapter, the oxidative or aerobic energy system operates during any physical activity that lasts longer than about two minutes, like distance running, swimming, hiking, or even just standing in line. Okay, that's an exercise, that is an effort, and you're still using your oxidative system to produce the needed ATP. So the oxidative system, <coughs> excuse me, requires oxygen to generate ATP, which is why it is considered an aerobic system. So we use the oxygen, that's why we call it aerobic. It cannot produce energy as quickly as the other two systems, as we covered in the previous chapter, but it can supply energy for much longer periods of time. So the bod body's ability to increase oxygen use is limited. This limit, known as maximal oxygen consumption, or VO2 max, it refers to the highest rate of oxygen consumption. So oxygen consumption at a, a random time during exercise which the definition is the volume of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute during a submaximal exercise task. Submaximal it means below maximal, so you are not pushing yourself or exerting your body to its maximum capacity. You're just uh, lingering under your maximum capacity at a uh, an intensity that is um, easy to deal with, okay? Not easy, but it either moderate or vigorous, but it's not maximal. That's why we call it VO2, volume of oxygen. But, but when you look at VO2 max, that is your capacity, actually. That is the single best measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. So it is the highest rate of oxygen consumption, VO2, an individual is capable of during maximum physical effort. And it's expressed as milliliters per kilogram of body weight per minute. And that is your cardiorespiratory fitness capacity. So um, how do you measure this? Everybody now must be asking themselves, what is my VO2 max? It is an individual number where you can measure in a lab or if with through field tests. So the VO2 max testing uh, is a, a highly um, expensive and time consuming and not a practical test, but it is the most accurate te testing for uh, measuring your actual absolute VO2 max value. So maximum VO2 test or graded exercise testing or GTX, excuse me, GXT, this is a typo, uh, for direct measurement of the value. Since, it, like I said, it's not as practical what we do is we do field tests and we estimate the VO2 max value with the norm data uh, compared with the data that we gather from the field test that we do. It differs, it varies uh, depending on the, the test that you use. So these are just examples and if you end up doing your extra credit assignment with the fitness portion, 
I will ask you to go through one of them so that you can find out what your VO2 max uh, value is, which is the single best measure of your cardiorespiratory fitness. So there is a walk run for either time or distance fitness tests, such as 12-minute Cooper run test or one-mile Rockport walk test. And there are others uh, that military is using, a mile and a half run test. So these are standard fitness tests, and there is a normative data uh, to estimate your VO2 max value uh, readily available on, on the web. So we will use those for the extra credit assignment. Uh, there is also another test which is <coughs> relevant for uh, sports that require climbing, for example, or any, any cardiorespiratory fitness. But uh, since it's a step board <coughs> that you use during the test, to, to go up and down, and it's a standard test called three-minute YMCA step test. Um, that might might, might be uh, uh, more relevant to use for uh, relevant sports. And then there is also a swim test, which is more specific to uh, activities in the water. This slide is going to summarize. Okay, the fit principle to develop your cardiorespiratory or improve your cardiorespiratory fitness. So these are the guidelines, and we will break it down in terms of the intensity, since there are a lot of guidelines, different guidelines, to prescribe exercise intensity for cardiorespiratory fitness activities. So um, accumulating, like we talked about on the second chapter, at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity, or at least 75 minutes per week of vigorous physical activity is enough to promote health. Most experts recommend that people exercise three to five days per week to build cardiorespiratory endurance. Um, training more than five days per week can lead to injury and it is not necessary for the typical person on an exercise program that is designed to promote wellness. So it is safe to do moderate intensity activities such as walking and gardening every day. Training fewer than uh, three days per week makes it difficult to improve your fitness. So. We try to, we strive for keeping that number in terms of frequency or number of times that you work out. Um, we try to keep it between three to five, not more than five, not less than three. Um, unless the exercise intensity is very high, so then you can maybe work out less than three. Um, remember, however, that some exercise is better than none. So even, even though you work out less than three times per week, it's still better than zero exercise. And then when you look at the duration, I'm going to cover the intensity uh, in a different slide. So let's just look at the time or duration for a single bout or single workout. It varies, again, between 20 to 60 minutes, one session or multiple sessions. So th they're giving you an option of breaking down into 10-minute uh, bouts. So if you were to do 60 minutes of a, a workout a day, you can divide that into six different bouts, which makes it easier to handle for some people. And the total duration of the exercise depends on its intensity. They're, so they're negatively correlated. If the exercise or the workout is a high intensity or vigorous intensity workout, then you keep the time shorter and vice versa. To improve cardiorespiratory endurance during a low to moderate intensity activity, such as walking or slow swimming, you should 
exercise for 30 to 60 minutes. For high intensity exercise, perform at the top of your target heart rate zone, which we will look at so soon what that means, then you should keep the um, duration to 20 minutes and that would be sufficient. So when you look at the types of activities, you know, it, it has to be enjoyable by the person and you have lots of options to improve cardiorespiratory endurance such as walking, jogging, biking, swimming, cross-country skiing, and playing sports, rope skipping, even lifting weights in a fashion that you can uh, also challenge or overload your cardio uh, respiratory system. So from this summary on slide 13 here, I'm going to take out this intensity portion and we will talk about that. Okay, so how are we going to determine the intensity of the exercise. There are different guidelines and we will cover um, most, almost all of them. So the first one is heart rate reserve. Okay, again I'm going back to the slide and it says 40 slash 50 to 85 percent of heart rate reserve plus resting heart rate. So this is one recommendation by American College of Sports Medicine Okay, and this is how we determine that. It's also called Carvonin formula, okay, or heart rate reserve formula. Heart rate reserve means the difference between your maximum heart rate, estimated maximum heart rate, and your resting heart rate. So this is this, these are the steps that we have to go through. First, we're going to estimate the heart rate max with this formula, 207 minus 0.7 times age. And we're going to count our resting heart rate. So this is important. You need to do this before getting out of bed in, in the morning, okay? And before changing your uh, horizontal position while you're still laying in bed because changing your body position might affect your heart rate and give you an uh, you know elevated heart rate so just stay laying down before getting out and you can count for 30 to 60 seconds to reduce error taken by palp um, to reduce the error so what you need to do is using your index and middle finger like shown in this picture you do it on the neck which is called a corroded artery or on the wrist on your radial artery okay you need to uh, apply a very gentle or light pressure or else it's going to reduce your uh, resting heart rate if you apply a uh, strong pressure on the artery so to keep it as realistic as possible, just palpate it gently. Use your neck or your wrist arteries and just count it to 30 seconds. If you do 30 seconds, just multiply it by two to figure out what the minute uh, value is. So that's your resting heart rate, RHR. So we got the estimated heart rate maximum then we measured or counted our resting heart rate. The third step is calculating the heart rate reserve. So heart rate reserve is the difference between the maximum heart rate and resting heart rate. Then as the fourth step, we will find the target training heart rate zone by the percent of heart rate reserve. Again, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide it says 40 slash 50 to 85 percent. That's the, um, the target heart rate zone. So you need to be working out between these two numbers. So this is the fourth step is going to give us those two numbers. Target training heart rate zone. So what we do is we take the first percent 
and multiply it by heart rate reserve and then add the resting heart rate on top of it and then we do it for the second one so I'll show you with an example take this person who is 22 years old with a resting heart rate 70 beats per minute they already counted their resting heart rate in the morning before getting out of bed and that's 70 beats per minute so the steps to follow first we're going to calculate their maximum heart rate or estimated or maximum heart rate with this formula which gives me 207 minus 0.7 times 22 their age okay gives me 192 that's the estimated uh, heart rate max then I'm going to uh, deduct their resting heart rate of 70 beats per minute from 192 to figure out their heart rate reserve which is 122 beats per minute then the lowest intensity being 50 percent because when you look at that other slide going back again and see this range 40 slash 50 40 is reserved for those people who have some chronic health conditions and they're just starting to work out so for young population and healthy population like you you should start with 100 uh, percent 50 uh, and then that's this is how we calculate it so 192 minus 70 which is 122 I could have just put 122 here which is the heart rate reserve times 0.50 okay I do the math and then I add the resting heart rate on top of it which is 70 and it gives me 131 beats per minute so that's the minimum heart rate during my workouts for this person and the maximum heart rate during their workout should be point percent 70 uh, 85 and this is how you calculate it and it gives me 174 beats per minute so this is the target heart rate zone for cardiorespiratory fitness training using the heart rate reserve formula going back I can see there is another method which is the maximum heart rate okay excuse me uh, which is the maximum heart rate instead of using the carvonin or heart rate reserve I just take the maximum heart rate and calculate the direct percentages off of it okay so going back to slide uh, 16 so that's other methods the first one is heart rate max 55 slash 65 to 90 percent of heart rate max so for that person their um, heart rate max was 192 if I do the math for 65 percent I get 125 and if I do the math for 90 percent I get 173 so that's the uh, recommended or prescribed target heart rate zone for that person why am I not taking 55 again that is reserved for those people with chronic health conditions uh, and just beginning to work out there is another method okay which is called RPE or in other words perceived level of exertion okay ratings of perceived exertion as you can see from this table on uh, the picture on the right side this is a scale of difficulty of the exercise that you feel okay repeated pulse counting during exercise sometimes can be a, a nuisance and it's not very practical so we can use our own judgment our feeling um, and you know just judge the exercise and we need to keep it at 12 to 16 so if 6 is even less than extremely light this uh, scale goes from 6 to 20 20 being maximal exertion if we want to improve our cardiorespiratory fitness level we need to keep the exercise between 12 to 16 and after a while you're, you will be able to 
associate a certain heart rate with a certain uh, rating from the scale and um, but it takes it takes a while and some practice um, so you can use the RPE instead of using any heart rate methods another easy method is the third one um, monitoring your ex exercise uh, exertion uh, especially to prevent overly intense exercise is the talk test. Although your breathing rate will increase uh, during moderate intensity cardiorespiratory endurance exercise, you should not work out so intensely that you cannot communicate. Speech is limited to short phrases during vigorous intensity exercise, so that's how you gauge the difficulty of the exercise. If you can only say like go or stop smaller phrases then you're working out at a vigorous intensity but if you can carry out a count conversation maybe it is too light then you're supposed to be working out so that that's a very good way of also gauging the difficulty of the or intensity of the exercise and the fourth one is the METs as discussed in the energy chapter one MET represents the body's resting metabolic rate, that is the energy or calorie requirement of the body at rest. So exercise intensity is expressed in multiples of resting metabolic rate, and that therefore it's called METs. For example, an exercise intensity of two METs is twice the resting metabolic rate. On this table, uh, you can find the recommended intensity intervals for moderate and vigorous. So moderate is here on this column and then the vigorous intensity cardiorespiratory endurance exercises for a given method. So you can use the target heart rate method. It's just a summary table. 55 to 69% is the moderate intensity. After 70, it's vigorous. And then uh, the Carvonen formula, heart rate reserve, taking into account your resting heart rate, which is a very important indicator of your uh, fitness level, by the way, because when you uh, get fit, your heart doesn't have to work as hard, so your resting heart rate uh, decreases. Therefore, taking that into account into the formula makes everything more accurate. So I highly recommend using the Carvonen formula if you can. So the moderate intensity would be 40 to 59 percent of your heart rate reserve, or 60 to 85 percent of your. Uh, for the vigorous, it's 60 to 85 percent of your heart rate reserve. When you look at the METs, it's three to seven METs for moderate intensity, eight to 12 METs for vigorous. RPE 45, which is somewhat hard, five to eight hard to very hard. This is a scale of uh, 1 to 10, by the way. So you need to, I sh what I showed you here is 6 to 20. So you need to uh, double these numbers that are given in your textbook to be able to compare uh, the relevant numbers. So this would represent 6 to 14 here, moderate intensity, and this would be 16 to 24. Um, Excuse me, I, I used the wrong row, but 4 to 5, which is 8 to 10, or 5 to 8, 10 to 16. So the talk test, speech with some difficulty, is the moderate intensity, and speech limited to short phrases is the vigorous intensity. So this is how we, again going back to this summary table, or the FIT table, we looked at the intensity um, assessment techniques or different methods and we can use maximum heart rate we can use heart rate reserve or rpe or talk test or mets okay now that we know what to do we need to understand how we should do it when we set to do a workout cardiorespiratory fitness exercise uh, we need to incorporate warm up and cool down like we do for muscle strength exercises or any other exercise. 
So we talked about this on sec chapter uh, two. Uh, so warm up sessions should include low intensity, whole body movements that should be that looks like or that are similar to those in the activity that will follow, such as walking slowly before beginning a brisk walk or jogging slowly before beginning a uh, run. An active warm-up of 5 to 10 minutes is adequate for most types of exercise. However, warm-up time will depend on your level of fitness, experience, and individual preferences. Like we discussed, this is all individual. There is no one size fits all when it comes to fitness. Developing fitness, that's why it is called personal training and you should not be copying anyone else's training programs that were designed for them. So it is an individual uh, response and you need to uh, develop understanding of your own body to understand how how much warm-up you would need or how much cool-down you would need. So um, this is another common question I get and I try to teach this in my activity classes too. Here is the question. What about stretching as part of a warm-up? Well, performing static stretches, static stretch is uh, a, 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 a Static movement or a pose, um, you just take the joint to the end of range and to the end of the range of motion and hold the position. That's called a static stretch. Well, doing these as part of the pre-exercise warm-up hasn't been found to prevent injury and has little or no effect on post-exercise muscle soreness. Static stretching before exercise may also adverse, adversely affect strength, power, balance, reaction time, and movement time. Because stretching may interfere with muscle and joint receptors that are used in performance of sport and movement skills. So for these reasons, it is often recommended that static stretches be performed at the end of your workout after your cool down but while your uh, muscles are still warm okay that's enough for the warm-up and cooling down after exercise is important for returning the body to a non-exercising state okay a cool down helps maintain blood flow to the heart and brain and redirects blood from working muscles to other areas of the body. So this is an important concept that's called a venous return and um, the cool down, gradual cool down, where, where you reduce the intensity of the exercise gradually until you stop uh, completely, will, will help your body um, to return the blood that was pumped out to your extremities because it was needed a lot because you were exercising for oxygen or waste products like we talked about, that needs to return back to, to the heart, okay, to avoid any fainting, dizziness, um, and lightheadedness. Uh, if you don't do it and if you stop abruptly, it might uh, create a problem where uh, the blood pulls down into the extremities and cannot return back to the brain and heart and for a brief moment a person can pass out or feel fe uh, feel very lightheaded and dizzy so to avoid all of that we would like to take the exercise intensity gradually to a full stop um, by decreasing the intensity uh, for example, following a running workout, you can begin your cool down by jogging at half speed for 30 seconds to a minute, then do several minutes of walking, reducing your speed slowly. Well, a good rule of thumb is to cool down at least until your heart rate drops below 100 beats per minute. But again, that's an individual response and you should find your own comfortable state where you feel that your body feels 
or returns back to the non-exercising state. So how are we going to build our program or build our cardiorespiratory fitness? For the initial stage, which is typically, uh, la which could typically last anywhere from three to six weeks, uh, ex you should exercise at the low end of your target heart rate zone. Okay, so you don't have to start with 50% uh, of the heart rate reserve. It again depends on your initial fitness level. Um, but whatever your initial fitness level is, just choose the low end of the target heart rate zone for three to six weeks. Begin with a frequency of three to four days per week and choose a duration appropriate for your fitness level like 12-15 minutes if you are very unfit, 20 minutes if you are sedentary but uh, relatively healthy and then 30 to 40 minutes if you are an experienced exerciser. Use this stage of your program to allow both your body and your schedule to adjust to your new exercise routine. When you can exercise at the upper levels of your frequency for five days per week and duration 30-40 minutes without excessive fatigue or muscle soreness, that means you are ready to progress. And if you can remember from the exercise physiology principles, progressive overload was one of them. So when you are ready to progress, you need to increase either frequency or duration before you increase intensity. And whenever you are ready, you need to change only one variable at a given time, not both increasing frequency or duration. Just pick one and go with it. And when you feel like, again, you are here, then you can increase duration. And then the last thing you need to be playing with it should be intensity to avoid injury and overtraining. Um, so increasing duration in increments of five to ten minutes every two to three weeks is usually appropriate. Signs that you are increasing overload too quickly include muscle aches, pains, lack of usual interest in exercise, or extreme fatigue and inability to complete a workout. So you need to keep an exercise log to be on top of your um, program, uh, programming and um, understanding the changes in your variables. Variables being frequency, duration, intensity, and type of the workout. Okay. This is my favorite topic, interval training. Uh, high intensity interval training is a type of interval training. Well, the reason we cover this is you will not improve your fitness indefinitely. The more fit you become, the harder you must work to improve. High intensity interval training, which is a series of very brief high intensity exercise sessions, interspersed with short rest periods is more effective at improving fitness rapidly. There are four components of interval training. Uh, the first one is distance or time um, of the exercise interval. So w whenever I do the very brief high intensity exercise uh, interval, how much or what is the distance I'm going to cover during that uh, high intensity bout. That's the distance or time. Repetition <coughs> is the number of times the exercise is repeated. How many times I'm going to go through those intervals. Intensity is the speed at which the exercise is performed. So intensity is the difficulty. How, what is the percent of your heart rate maximum that you're going to go at during those high intensity bouts. And the rest is the time spent recovering between exercises. So these are uh, considered to be the variable, variables of your high intensity interval training 
program design and you just manipulate those variables to create a program. So you can use interval training in your favorite aerobic exercises. For example, a runner might do 48 reps of 200 meter sprints at near maximum effort. So that would be the distance uh, focused interval or high intensity interval training or a tennis player might practice volleys against the wall as fa fast as possible for 48 reps lasting 30 seconds so in this example you're using the time a swimmer might sw swimmer might swim 48 reps of 50 meters at 100 percent effort again a distance and then you just decide how much of a rest you're going to take between the intervals and how many times you're going to repeat this. So this is another way of designing a high intensity interval training. Um, in no way I'm suggesting you know you should be following this but this is just one example. Uh, it's fun. You can incorporate some weights with this or you can just use your own body weight. So it's called Tabata, but mainly these are body weight high intensity exercises. So this is how they designed it. Uh, high intensity for 20 seconds followed by 10 seconds of rest. And they designed it in different Tabatas or groups of exercises. Uh, so this is repeated eight times for a total of four minutes. Each Tabata takes four minutes. Uh, so every exercise they do eight times. Uh, eight one-legged burpees, one-legged burpees left side, high knees, push-ups, Spider-Man, and repeat cycle one once. And this is how they do it. But that's just one way. Although high intensity interval training produces substantial fitness improvements, here is my suggestion. It is best to integrate it into your total exercise program and not go with this all the time. This is a supplement to your workout program. It's a good supplement to um, get more benefit out of your program, but do not practice interval training more than three days per week. Intervals are exhausting and easily lead to injury. And you can see other examples uh, in your textbook. Or you can talk to me about designing your interval training based on your lifestyle, based on the sports that you play, or based on the recreational activities that you're engaged in with. So, after an improvement stage of four, six months, you may reach your goal, okay, of an acceptable level of fitness, and you can then maintain fitness by continuing to exercise at the same intensity at least three non-consecutive days every week. So if you stop exercising, you lose your gains in fitness fairly rapidly, as discussed on the second chapter as the reversibility principle. If you take time off for any reason, start your program again at a lower level, level and rebuild your fitness in a slow and systematic way. So engaging in multiple types of endurance activities, an approach known as cross-training, okay, can help boost enjoyment uh, and avoid burnout and prevent some types of injuries. For example, someone who has been jogging five days a week may change her program, so she jogs twice a week and then maybe plays soccer once a week, okay, goes for a bike ride one day a week and joins a CrossFit class for another day a week. So that's just one example of how you can cross train. While all these activities build endurance. Alternating between them reduces the strain on specific joints and muscles resulted by using the same um, structure of body movements and uh, varying your activities also offers new physical and mental challenges that can keep your fitness program fresh and fun. 
um, how do we avoid um, injuries okay exercise saf safety is important and when you exercise in hot weather and uh, heat stress these are some um, injuries or heat injuries that you might uh, end up having and we should avoid them we should know them to be able to avoid them so the first one is dehydration this is the excessive loss of body fluid and it is very dangerous the heat cramps they are sudden muscle cramps and pain associated with intense exercise in hot weather heat exhaustion so it's going up the scale um, illness that is an illness not just a muscle spasm it is an illness resu resulting from um, exertion in hot weather and heat stroke it is a severe condition and often fatal heat illness characterized by significantly elevated core body temperature when your core body temperature is too high your body will shut down so how can we how can we avoid this uh, well we can keep drinking fluids before and during exercise especially in the hot weather environments um, as a general rule this is the suggestion drink about two cups four hours before the exercise and 15 minutes immediately before exercise so maybe not uh, two cups but a cup 15 minutes immediately before exercise so it's going to be equal to two or two to four cups I mean three to four cups in total before and then during exercise which um, if it is less than 60 minutes just drink three to eight ounces of water every 15 to 20 minutes uh, and consume a sports drink with electrolytes every 15 to 20 minutes when exercising longer than 60 minutes so that you can supplement or replenish your carbohydrates that are running low in your uh, muscle um, glycogen stores uh, this is your gauge your urine urine color uh, it's a good marker a dark color means that you might be dehydrated get out the heat remove excess clothing drink cold fluids and apply cool or damp towels to the body or immerse the body in cold water uh, dehydration is really critical um, and unfortunately this is a system or a process that your body cannot handle efficiently uh, if you feel thirsty already that means you are already dehydrated or when you want to drink water once your lips touch the water your brain will get the message that your body is uh, hydrated enough even with one or two sips of water that's why you need to keep pushing your body to drink uh, adequate amounts of fluid or water in general uh, in general okay uh, even though you're not working out in hot weather we can get dehydrated in cold weather at home sitting you need to keep hydrating your body because water is an important element in all the chemical reactions as discussed in the previous energy chapter how about cold weather well uh, hypothermia is the most typical uh, hypothermia is the low body temperature due to exposure to cold conditions very low body temperature that's one common injury frostbite uh, freezing of body tissues characterized by paleness numbness and a loss of cold sensation I used to be a mountaineer and we used to climb really um, high mountains in in snow and some of my friends got frost uh, bite uh, of their fingers and um, some of them their toes and if the, it gets really uh, serious then they have to um, cut that uh, digit off of their 
I mean, I've never seen a person, but I've I've seen stories or other well, other people, and and you can also do your own research. So that's important. It, you don't have to be a mountaineer, but if you like to run outside in cold weather, you need to take care of your body, and we will discuss that in a minute. Wind chill is another one. Measure of how cold it feels based on the rate of heat loss from exposed skin caused by cold and wind. So <clears throat> to exercise safely in cold conditions, first don't stay out in very cold temperatures for too long. Take both the temperature and the wind into account when planning your exercise session. Of course, clothing is, is very important because it provides insulation and helps trap warm air next to the skin. You need to dress in layers so you can remove them as you warm up and can put them back on if you get cold. Uh, nowadays, the weather has been really um, uh, sketchy and I've been trying to go out for runs and that's how I do. I dress in layers and if I feel really warmed up then I take the outer layer off and you know wrap it around my waist and I run like that and if get, it gets cold during my runs sometimes the climate changes uh, radically so that's what I do. I put it back on so make sure you dress in layers. A substantial amount of heat loss comes from the head and neck, so keep these areas covered. Make sure you have a, a neck uh, wrap, like a, a scarf. Uh, that is really important, uh, and a, a beanie or a, a, a hat for your head. In sub-freezing temperatures, luckily in California we don't run into those temperatures, but if you ever want to you know ski or go to somewhere where there are sub freezing temperatures protect the areas of your body most susceptible to pro frostbite like your fingers toes ears nose and cheeks with warm socks mittens or gloves and a cap hood or a ski mask wear clothing that breathes and will wick moisture away from your skin to avoid uh, being cold or overheated by trapped pers uh, perspiration, sweating, and then many types of comfortable lightweight clothing that provide good insulation are available. It's also important in cold conditions to warm up thoroughly and to drink plenty of fluids. Especially in cold wa uh, weather, uh, you don't feel like you're getting dehydrated. You don't feel like drinking water, but it is very common to run into that dehydration problem in cold weathers too. And uh, finally, poor air quality, okay, is another uh, risk factor. Air pollution can decrease exercise performance and negatively affect health, particularly if you smoke or have respiratory problems such as asthma, bronchitis, or emphysema. The effects of smog are worse during exercise than at rest. This is why it is so important because air enters the lungs faster and polluted air may also contain carbon monoxide which displaces oxygen in the blood unfortunately and reduces the amount of oxygen available to the working muscles. One study found that exercise in polluted air could decrease lung function to the same extent as heavy smoking. That is very interesting. And that could be one of your topics that you might want to do your um, scientific analysis assignment, poor air quality and exercise. Okay, the last two concepts, and these are highly important for you to understand. In our exercise physiology field, <clears throat> these are the, this is the terminology we use to understand what we're talking about. The acute exercise response means your body's reaction 
to the immediate exercise, on the onset of exercise. Once you begin exercising, what happens to some of the markers in your physiology? <coughs> this is what we're talking about on this slide. So when you start exercising, there's going to be a drastic increase in skeletal muscle blood flow. Normally, the amount of blood or percentage or the ratio of blood that goes to your skeletal muscle is around 15 to 20 percent of the total amount of blood flow. But when you start exercising, it's going to increase to 85 to 90 percent. So the majority of the blood will go to the skeletal muscle. That's why cool down is so important to avoid this blood to be pulled pulled in, in your extremities and not be able to go back to your heart and brain. So the second one is the increased blood flow to heart. Of course, your heart is working harder, needing more oxygen. So the blood also, uh, blood flow to the heart will be, be increased. Another organ that gets more blood flow is the skin because it needs to uh, your body needs to sweat through your skin to get rid of that increased body temperature to avoid the heat stroke. So skin, heart, and skeletal muscle gets almost all the blood flow. And if you look at this one, decreased blood flow to the GI tract, liver, kidneys. So all the other organs will be on standby, will not require any, any, uh, oxygen or blood flow or they will require it at minimum levels. And then when you look at the cardiovascular markers, um, increased heart rate, increased stroke volume, and cardiac output once you start exercising. Increased sweating because again you need to get rid of the increased uh, body temperature increased blood pressure since the, the, the heart is pumping the blood so hard the blood pressure will go up but that is nothing to be scared of it's only temporary and of course your breathing rate rate will be increased so these are the acute exercise responses the next slide is going to look at the training effects of cardiorespiratory exercise training these are also called chronic adaptations to training. So we applied the principle, FIT principle, and we went through our exercise training for a while, let's say two months, and this is what happens to our body, or uh, this is what happens to someone uh, who is really fit, like this person in the picture. So they will have increased capillary density because the gas exchange happens there. So your body tends to increase the density of the capillaries when you keep exercising or when you train your body aerobically or cardiorespiratory uh, fitness training. Increased size and number of mitochondria where the oxidative uh, system takes place to create the ATP, increased mitochondrial enzymes, same thing, increased VO2 max, of course, your oxygen uptake uh, capacity, and increased glycogen stores. So to be able to store more glycogen at, at locally, the muscle and liver, um, you will increase that ability through training increased ability to use lactic acid and fat as fuels so that you can spare the muscle glycogen. This is a very common thing that we see in athletes. They are able to use the lactic acid that they produce through the lactic acid or uh, anaerobic systems as another fuel or fat to fuel their activity, especially in the beginning to spare the muscle glycogen to the uh, the end of the exercise where the the you know you where you determine the winner and the loser if you will and decreased resting heart rate since 
heart is a muscle and you just trained that muscle and made it stronger, that muscle doesn't need to uh, work as many times. In other words, it doesn't have to beat as many times to deliver the same amount of oxygen. Since the muscle is so strong with only one beat, it is able to send a large amount of blood, which is a stroke volume, uh, for a person who is uh, trained at their resting um, condition. So decreased resting heart rate. If you want to gauge a person's cardiorespiratory fitness level really quickly and briefly, you can just ask their resting heart rate. If it's a low amount, of course, you need to eliminate the other risk factors, but if you're looking at a young individual, if their resting heart rate is low, that means they're fit, they're fit aerobically. And increased resting stroke volume, of course. Since now your heart is stronger with one beat, it's gonna send a more uh, blood. <clears throat> and it is continued on the second slide. Heart chambers size, it's called also hypertrophy of your heart. Uh, it will it be increased. The blood volume in general will be increased. Uh, increased capillary density. Uh, we talked about the size and um, number of mitochondria, the enzymes, VO2 max. This is a, um, a duplicate slide, I think. Uh, but yeah, more on the physiological responses or training effects, excuse me. Increased glycogen stores, ability to use lactic acid and fat as fuel. So this slide serves as a, a um, iteration, reiteration. So this picture comes directly from your textbook and you can also review all the long-term effects on the right side which we refer to as the chronic adaptations and immediate effects, the acute responses once you start exercising and you can just take a look at this to see it in one place. And finally, before I close this chapter, I would like to remind you the benefits of endurance training in general. Of course, you will have improved cardiorespiratory functioning. I'm not talking about being fit only, but your functioning, physiological functioning of your cardiorespiratory system will be improved. You will have improved cellular metabolism um, to, to take care of your ATP production um, oxidation, through oxidative systems, of course. And three, reduced risk of chronic diseases cardiovascular diseases, and some types of cancers, which includes colon, breast, and reproductive organ cancers. These are research findings. So pay attention and try to e ha come up with a program where you can improve your uh, cardiorespiratory endurance. These are important, critical for your health especially during these times where we want to keep our health in its uh, best form, best shape. And then um, reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, reduced risk of osteoporosis if weight-bearing, of course, you have to go through weight-bearing exercises to osteoporosis, uh, to avoid oste osteoporosis and increase your bone mineral density and it, redu it reduces the risk of chronic inflammation. Again, very relevant for COVID-19. Uh, you need to reduce the levels of inflammation in the body, and that's, that's deaths from all c causes. And better control of body fat. We already know that if you do aerobic training, it's gonna um, burn extra body fat so you will get rid of it if you have any extra body fat it's going to improve your immune function again it's very relevant to our case right now and it's going to improve psychological and emotional well-being this could be another 
uh, presentation topic for you. So these are all the benefits and we should keep our cardiorespiratory fitness at its best shape as possible at all times. So the summary, we talked about the physiology, blood pressure, what is endurance, how do we develop it, what are the safety concerns and how do we in, uh, prevent injuries and finally these two and I want you to understand the differences between the responses to acute exercise and training effects of cardiorespiratory exercise which is also called chronic adaptations. So that's all we're going to cover for this chapter. I hope you enjoyed it and I will be looking for list, um, uh, your questions next week on Monday. Have a great day. Thank you for listening.